Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. We're so excited to share the power of healing from complex trauma with all of you. It's inspiring to know that so many of you tune in to learn about how healing from complex trauma is possible. Are you interested in deepening your understanding of NARM? We're excited to present The Inner Circle, NARM's online learning community. Each month, members receive direct mentorship from NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller, NARM training director, Brad Kammer, and other NARM faculty as they present NARM demonstration sessions and provide extensive debriefs on applying NARM with real clients. They also present live topic webinars that deconstruct the various elements of complex trauma. Members also get access to archived material and other learning resources, as well as access to a private Facebook group with other professionals learning NARM around the world. The Inner Circle is a hub for the international NARM community where people working with complex trauma come together to connect, network, and develop trauma-informed projects to help our world. You, our Transforming Trauma listeners, can receive a free 14-day trial with access to the three-month archive by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash free trial. And now for our interview. Dr. Elaine Leader has been a writer since the 70s and a professor since 1977. She has worked in mental hospitals, gerontology, foster care, domestic violence, and drug and alcohol counseling as a social worker and psychotherapist. Elaine's most meaningful work has been in prisons, where she is now doing victim-offender dialogues with victims of crime and the men who committed these acts. During this work, Elaine has found that redemption is possible and that people are not the worst things they have done. Some of her most powerful interactions have been with men in prison who have transformed their lives. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Elaine Leader. All right. I'm sitting here with Dr. Elaine Leader. We are so excited to have you here on Transforming Trauma. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So we usually start this podcast with the question that we often ask our clients, which is, what would you like listeners to get out of our conversation today? Basically, I would like to talk about the fact that I have been working with prisoners in maximum and minimum security prisons for the last 28 years. And the message of my talks are always, prisoners are people too. And they are there because of the traumas of their early childhood that transforms them into committing crimes that they eventually come to regret, and that it transforms their life when they engage in restorative justice. Great. And so if you wouldn't mind just beginning with telling us about the work that you're doing in the field of complex trauma. Basically, what I do is work in prisons with men who have committed serious crimes, people who have done murder, kidnappings, rapes, armed robberies. And the work that I do is about bringing the victims in to the prisons to meet with the person who committed the crime. And I spend time with the victims ahead of time and with the people who've committed the crimes ahead of time and bring them together after preparing them through many months of work so that they're ready to engage in a dialogue of equality. The criminal justice system tends to make people adversaries and sets them up as Well, it's the defense attorney and the district attorney who do the arguing in the court. The victim can make a victim impact statement if they're still alive or the family of the victim. But the person who did the crime is usually not even allowed to turn around and look. And so this is the first time that they come to meet together to actually talk about what happened They've both been locked in a trauma sometimes 10, 15, 20, 25, even 30 years ago. And they've never had the opportunity to talk about it. So I see this as a chance for them to talk their way through a complex experience that both had. And the people that I work with 
are remarkable. I just have to say that usually it is it has to be sought by the victim or the victim's family. So the fact that they're asking to meet with whomever did the crime means that they're already pretty evolved human beings because you can't be going into a room to meet someone who murdered your daughter unless you have some kind of a unique open heart or a willingness to talk about it. The person who has done the harm, some people call them criminals or prisoners or whatever work, but we call them the people who did the harm, often, in fact, always with everyone that I've worked with, they have enormous regret and remorse. They would love to have forgiveness if they could get it, but that's not always what they're seeking. What they want is to really explain and say how it happened, why it happened, and what it is. And they always ask what it is that I can do in any way to make up for what I have done to you. So it's a very profound experience with two sets of people locked in early trauma and moving together into a, a growthful pattern. And that really stands out to me, moving together in a growthful pattern. Wow. And you said that you help prepare them for many months. I'm curious, what can I ask what that looks like? What's that process? Oh, of course. Of course. Well, first, let me say, everybody that I have met who has done a crime has some early childhood trauma. Something happened. It might have been horrible racist experiences. It might have having been injected with drugs at an early age or turned into a warrior by the age of four or been abandoned or watched mother be killed or beaten. And so those are, from my experience, and I've now worked with hundreds of convicted felons, all of them have had something like that happen in their lives, which led them to do something that was so egregious and harmful that they're locked away now. And the people who were hurt, the people who were harmed, might also have had early trauma that put them in such a situation. One never knows that part. Because for the most part, I tried to work in the preparation. I meet, I'm given a case through the California Department of Corrections, and then they refer it to an agency that I am a um, pro bono volunteer with. And all that we're given is a cover sheet that says the nature of the crime, the victim, the name of the person who committed the crime, and what prison they're in. And we contact the victim and talk to them extensively in the first session, usually by phone or by um, Zoom, to find out what happened in their tape on the whole thing and what they want to get out of it. Then we go to the prison, and everyone that I've worked with has been incarcerated. We go in cold. They don't know why we're coming. So we show up, and I have a partner. We always are matched, two of us. And we go in and we say, do you know why we're here? And they never know why we're there. Sometimes they think it might be a lawyer or, you know, um, it's not visitors because we go in through the legal system. And we offer them this opportunity to dialogue with the person whom they hurt. To a person everyone that I've encountered, except two, have said absolutely that they have been waiting for this moment for as long as they could do it. Some have written letters of apology, but they're not sent to their victims. They're kept in their files, and the victim has to seek it. So here is an opportunity to really get down and get into the nitty-gritty. So once they accept, if they accept, We then, in the first session, really spend a lot of time. How did you get here? It could be just starting with early childhood or with the crime itself. How did you happen to be the lookout on a kidnapping? How did you happen to 
shoot this young woman in a parking lot? How did you happen to kill your girlfriend in a car accident? And they describe in detail either the incident, usually they start with the incident, and then we go back and we go into, well, who are you? And how did this come about? What was your life like? I have to say, you know, I was once a psychotherapist in a previous incarnation. This is like instant therapy, because if you're dealing with your trauma without the person who traumatized you, maybe you can't work it through in the same way that you can if they're present. And so I've seen people healed as a result of these dialogues because there is genuine remorse and there is genuine forgiveness, and there's true redemption that takes place as a result of it. It's a very spiritual experience that I engage in with these people. I see it as a form of healing the world, of mending the harm that has been done to both victim and offender, if you want to use that term, and I have to say, I feel enormously privileged to be present to watch the transformation that takes place with these folks. So we go back often for months prepping them. It isn't just a one-shot deal. After I meet with the person who did the harm, and I've only worked with men, I've never worked with women, I then go back to the victim and I talk about what they said. And we sort of become the intermediaries for a while, getting the stories out, probing, prodding, helping them form what it is that they want to say to each other so that they just don't go in cold. They are, I mean, we go to the minutest point like, do you want? the victim to come in first, or or does the person who did the crime want to be there first? And who do you want as your support people? Because both the person who was harmed and the person who did the harm is allowed to have a support person present. So we'll talk about that person, and then we have to engage with those people and get them in the loop. So Zoom is wonderful because we can do it afar for the preparation. Although I always go to the home of the victim at least once, and I always go back to the prison two, three, four, five, six. There's one that I'm working on, a man who's in Pelican Bay. We've been at that one for four years, only because of medical conditions and things that intervened and we're trying to move it along. So I have to say that they are the deepest meaningful experiences I've ever encountered because there is weeping. We always have a box of tissues in the middle of the room. Everybody's crying, you know, including at one point we had a parole officer present and he was weeping because people are truly honest in these interactions because they know they each have a remarkable opportunity to heal in a way that they couldn't have healed beforehand. Wow. Just hearing you talk about it, and even just in general terms, I mean, you, you haven't even told us any specific stories or anything, but as I was getting ready for this conversation, I just got so excited to hear about this process. And so I, I'm excited to hear more of the details. But even just as you were talking in general terms, I just feel kind of my heart opening and such gratitude for the work that you're doing and the fact that this is even being done, that this, you know, you, you said you're a, a pro bono volunteer. And so whoever created this whole program that you're doing, this is really incredible. Well, the program actually is through the Department of Corrections in California. There's a victim service office, and they alert the victim as to parole hearings or movement of the person who did the crime and once and psychotherapy and other kinds of work. And one option under that umbrella is the victim offender dialogue. 
Most victims don't seek it out. You have to be a pretty remarkable person to be willing to meet the person who did such harm to you. So we're already talking about people who are forgiving, or if not forgiving, curious and open. And then what happens is the referral comes to the agency that I'm a volunteer with, Ahimsa Collective in Oakland, and they receive grants and funding to do these things. And then there are many, many of us who do these. They also have a number of programs inside prisons, which I don't do. I have done programs in prisons, but this isn't it. Now, those programs are more, they are restorative justice as well, but they are opportunities for groups of people who have done the crimes and the harm to come together and process their early childhood traumas, the impact of all of that on who they became, and help them understand how they came to do whatever it was that they did, and help move them through a form of transformation. A colleague of mine, John Irwin, wrote a book called Lifers, and he talks about the four-stage process that people who have committed crime go through. And the first stage is the awakening, the being aware that they have really done something pretty horrific. You can almost tell if somebody hasn't awakened yet, they might say something like, well, I caught a crime, meaning like a cold. I caught a cold. Well, you don't catch a crime. You did a crime. And so getting them past seeing the criminal justice system as hurting them. And I have to say, honestly, criminal justice systems are quite unjust. Right. Most of the people in prison are people of color, and the criminal justice system is not always equal in its treatment. I, could, I have a case now that I'll tell you about later that breaks my heart. But first, there's awakening. Then there's programming. And that means that the person who did the harm has to really start to use whatever is in the prison that is available. Prisons like San Quentin here in California, there's lots of programming. There's 3,000 volunteers and all kinds of self-help groups that men there can go to, education programs. But not all prisons in all states, nor all prisons in California have such deep programming. So sometimes they have to do it on their own. And let me say, it can often be the other prisoners who help them get their act together. There's a fabulous podcast called Ear Hustle, which means gossip in prison lingo. And it's the inside scoop from the prisoners' points of view about what goes on in prison. And a recent episode was called OG, the old guys, the old guard. And the old guys are the ones who teach the new guys how to be civilized and the rules of being in prison. And they might mentor and take someone under their wing to show them that there's another way besides being a gangbanger and a hard ass. And oftentimes, if someone has been in prison for many years, they get past the bravado and the toughness and realize they're doing a long term and that they have to do their internal work. And they see others doing their internal work and they become the role models with each other because Prisoners who are incarcerated can confront the crap that somebody might be saying. They know it better than you or I would know it. And they call them out on it. It's wonderful to watch. I've seen it. After programming, and that can go on for years because some of these men that I've worked with are lifers and some life without parole. Lifers mean that they've given sentence like 25 to life, 30 to life, but there's an end date. They can come up for parole after serving a, a certain amount of time, and some of them get out. And so if you're in for a life without parole, you can still program and transform your life and turn yourself into a better person in prison. 
I know lots of guys who are never going to get out. And I often say that some of my best friends are murderers, rapists, and kidnappers because they have done the hard work that people on the street don't have to do. Maybe if you really had a childhood trauma, you do deeper work. Well, these folks are forced to do deep work because there they sit in these cells sometimes 23 hours a day. How much can you work out or do comic books or watch television? At a certain point, Mm -hmm. you have to be self-reflective, and I've seen it happen. So after programming comes atonement, which really the sense of I must somehow atone for what I've done. And that can be in prison. That can be becoming a hospice worker or being, you know, in programming and helping other folks and redeeming themselves in some way. And then the final stage is the redemption stage where, and that's often where I find myself at the stage with the people who are ready to do the redemption work. I had a one young man once who said to a father, there is nothing that I can ever do to bring your daughter back to you. And the father, who was in fact a police officer, said, oh yes, there is. You could never use drugs again. And this young man has stayed clean and has communicated with the father, the police officer, and maintained his sobriety for a while yet. We'll see how long it lasts, but we're sure hoping. So there's all kinds of ways to do redemption. I've seen men write remarkable letters of apology. Things like, oh, one of them, how did it go? It was, every day I wake up and I think of her, and every day I must live for two people. When I brush my teeth, I think of her. When I talk to my friends, I must be a good person to honor her. And it went on and on like this because he truly felt like he had to redeem himself for having shot this young woman to death. And I've had others, in fact, one I'm working with right now at San Quentin, who wrote them a really a very profoundly beautiful letter saying, on such and such a day, I kidnapped you. I held you at gunpoint. I threatened you, I frightened you, I locked you up, I made you do heinous things, robbery, I put fear in your heart, and he was very detailed. I'm not giving you details of what he did. And for this, I just say I am profoundly sorry for what I have done to you. And if there is any way that I can make it up to you, please let me know. And the letter, there were three victims for that. He has one for each. And another one had a letter for two victims and the support person, because the support person had really picked up the pieces after the trauma that happened crime and had been there from the night of the crime to today. So that man. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He just said, I'm truly sorry for what I have put you through, through all of this. But they did forgive. And oftentimes, people continue the relationship if it's allowed by the court. The father, I told you, in which the young meth addict killed his daughter in a car accident, is remaining in communication with the young man who is still in prison. Oh, and I'm now working with a victim who is so inspired by this work that she now goes into prisons speaking as a victim to those who've committed similar kinds of crimes because she says she really wants to carry the message of restorative justice and forgiveness. You've probably heard the phrase, many people know it. I've heard it from two victims. I don't want to hate the person who did the crime. It would be like drinking poison and hoping that I would kill him. I have more cases that I can euphemistically talk about. 
Yeah, yeah. If there's any specifics, I wonder before we go into that, though, I wondered if you could talk because you've mentioned all of these, what did you call them offenders? I, I can't remember how you preferred it. The people who did the harm. Yes. So that they all have a history, that there's always complex traumas. I would love to hear how you hold that term. How would you define complex trauma in, in the work that you do? Well, I think it's cumulative, cumulative trauma. You know, starting out perhaps as a child uh, being put in foster care and then moved around and then beaten up, and then joining a gang and having to prove that they're manly enough. And so they shoot someone, and, you know, and the fear and the horror of doing that and then becoming desensitized to doing that. I had one man who I really so respect now. He's out, married. I went to his wedding. He has wonderful employment. He's quite religious at this point. And he said, I had horrors throughout my childhood, and I was ignored by my mother. And I joined a gang, and I wanted to belong to that gang. So I put my hand up, and I said, I will do this killing, because I want to show you that I want to belong. And then he did another one to be a ma the macho gang member. And it was complex trauma over and over and over. And then let me tell you, you get to prison and it's worse. There's no healing in prison if you're locked into a cell that's the size of a cage. And, you know, unless you find some mentor or program or something, there's very little opportunity for transformation unless you seek it out. And so this is not rehabilitation. This is retribution that's happening in prisons. They're being treated like animals. And I will talk about the man that I'm working with in Pelican Bay, who my heart breaks for him. He was present for a murder. He was framed for the murder, and the person who did the murder got away. The guy was given life without parole plus 11 years. He's been locked up now almost 30 years. To this day, when we did our first victim offender dialogue, he swore to the mother and sister of the victim that he did not do it and that he would like to find the person who did it so that he could get out. This guy has had surgery, and they left a piece of medical equipment in his body, and it's floating around, and he gets sent to medical facilities and then back to Pelican Bay, where he's locked up 23 hours a day. That's inhumane. Other countries are much better. Some are worse. Some states are worse. But many countries are better. Finland, for example, has programming in which convicted felons live in dormitories and are given education and programming, and they wear normal clothing, and there's no bars on the doors. And if they have good behavior, they can go out or they can have visitation of families over the weekend. I mean, we're talking about trying to help someone change their life, yeah. not treating them like animals. Right. And I do have to say there are some, I'm not saying that every person who works in prison treats prisoners like animals. I know some very fine correction officers who are humane, but the system itself is structured in such a way that that's an aberration, not the norm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I consider myself an abolitionist. I want to abolish prisons as we know them. I'm doing restorative justice because I am a pragmatist, and I know they're not going to be destroyed in my lifetime. So I'm going to be putting Band-Aids on cancers till I die by doing this kind of work. But on the outside, I'm still doing policy work, trying to transform the criminal injustice system, as we know. You know, I, I just came back from a civil rights tour to the South, and I went to a fabulous museum, the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson. And this museum 
went from slavery to mass incarceration and took us through it all so that we could just see how it has evolved over time. The racism and the structural inequality that is so embedded in our system that people don't even, unless you're a person of color or someone trying to do something about it, they don't even see it. Yeah. And I'm working on reparations, educating about reparations for African Americans particularly. But the Equal Justice Initiative Museum was remarkable. And then I went out into their monuments and acres of acres of hanging slabs, hanging with the names of every county in the South that had hangings, lynchings, torturing, murders of African Americans on and listed all their names. And you walk for acres looking at these many, many hanging slabs. If you could put photos up, I would urge you to do so. It really shows you how we're continuing that cycle today and to the tortured who are still in prisons today. So I have a mission and I've been on it for a long time. And yes, it's complex, cumulative trauma that these folks are experiencing. And you said you're putting Band-Aids on cancer, but to the individuals whose lives you're impacting, I'm sure it feels much deeper and much more important than a Band-Aid. I hear the sentiment that this is just a temporary fix in terms of the whole system and how complex it is and you're doing what you can and it's such important work. Right, exactly. You know, I'll be honest with you, I get more out of it sometimes, I think, than even the people going through because I have the privilege of being with remarkable people who are open to an experience that most people are not open to. I mean, I've mentioned to folks, I go to prison and do this, and they go, how do you go into prison? Aren't you scared? No. You know, I have never once been threatened in any way, and I've been doing this for 28 years. People in prison are thrilled that we're there. They want to treat us well because we're treating them humanely. My talk is prisoners are people too. I used to teach in prison and then I ran self-help groups before I did this kind of work. And we never ask, what was your crime? Brian Stevenson has a wonderful phrase, nobody is the worst thing they have ever done in their lives. You want to be known for your worst thing? I sure don't. So we don't lead with, well, when I'm doing the victim offender dialogues, yes, but otherwise in working with people in prison in general, you don't ask. And I do have to say, people who do restorative justice have a very spiritual orientation to it. We realize that we are doing reparative work. We're touching the soul. We're elevating people to a higher evolutionary plane, if you will, by healing this trauma that they've been through. So we accept people as they are. We make no judgment. Okay, you murdered three people. We're still going to talk to you and treat you like a human being. So too with the victims. We treat people with the sense that you can be healed. You can make changes. And we all have changed ourselves over time. Why not give that opportunity to people who've done what we consider to be the worst that you can possibly do? You mentioned you had a few that you could tell us a few more details. I wonder who jumps out at you as who you'd like to share. Oh, I have so many. And, you know, I have definitely, I want you to know this, I'm all confident in terms of no identifying information, right? right? I mean, absolutely. but I could speak broadly about it. One of my first cases was a young woman who uh, had been coming home from her bridal shower and was hit in a head-on collision, and her mother and her sister were killed. And she had gone to high school with the man who was drunk driving. He went to prison for 20 years, and she got notice 20 years later that he was about to be 
a release. He had done his time, and he had done good time in prison, meaning he had done programming, he had changed, and they let him out after his 20 years. She knew he was coming home, and she didn't want to encounter him in a small town where they both lived. So we put this together very quickly. I mean, I talked to her on the phone. I went to see him in the prison, and we got together. It was quite beautiful. First of all, they hugged when they entered the room because they had known each other in high school. And then we sat down, and he said very early on, you know, I didn't know your mother and sister. Tell me about them. And she spent a lot of time describing who they were and what they were like, and it was very touching. And then he said, I'm going to be out in a week or two. May I go to their graves? And will you come with me? And I want to bring flowers, and I want to honor them. It still brings tears to my eyes. I mean, hello, this man killed two women. But he had such remorse, and he was such a human being. She said, of course, you know, I'm honored that you want to do this, and I want you to go on the lecture circuit with me. I want us to go to high schools and talk about drunk driving. Wow, what an invitation. Yeah, and that happens every time. That's so amazing. There's always something that happens like that. This young woman has given me permission to even give more detail, so I'm allowed to. Okay. There's a young woman that I'm working with now. We did a victim of thunder dialogue. I think it was the end of November. And her father had been stabbed at a party. She was young. She was maybe seven or eight years old. And the father was killed. The whole family was quite angry. It was a brawl, and who stabbed whom is still confusing, but the man took responsibility. He was incarcerated. I think he got 18 to life, and this was already 27 years, because in prison, he never got his act together. He thought he was a piece of crap. He killed somebody. He had been the one I talked about who was trained to be a warrior by age four Mm. and given acid and had been given told to fight. And this young woman went to a parole hearing, probably it was about three years ago, because the families are invited to parole hearings, and she went. Everyone else in the family hates this guy, wants him dead. She said to the parole board, I forgive him. And I want to speak to him, and I want to meet him. He had refused to go to the parole hearing because he just figured, forget about it. Nothing good's going to come of it. But he heard, he was told what she said in that hearing. So I believe he came in, and they had a short little dialogue. And then we proceeded to organize a longer one. And we went in November, and she came with her husband and her mother-in-law. And she had been in trouble as a young woman. She'd had two kids out of wedlock, dropped out of high school, had really suffered as a result of the death of her father. And he, in prison, had never gotten his act together. But as a result of this young woman forgiving him at that parole hearing, he started to program and asked to be transferred to a prison that had more programming. And he did get moved. And he's now in programming, doing what I was talking about, a programming and atonement. And he has asked for an early parole hearing because he is working so hard on changing himself. He had refused to see his own children, and now he wants to do whatever he can to change his life and to make it up to this young woman. And every time we see him, he says, I'm doing it for her. So we'll see. I mean, this is still a process 
but I'm hoping that as a result of her intervention, he will see his own children, receive more programming, eventually be paroled, and make some reconciliation in some way. And she's the one who's on, she goes to different prisons speaking about being a victim and how she forgave and her process. So that's a pretty good one, too. Let me think about it in other cases. I have worked on other cases. I don't have permission, really, to speak about them because um, they're still in process, and some of the people are still in prison, and I don't want to do anything at all to jeopardize their possibility of parole. You've shared some really profound stories already with us, and I, I know my heart has felt so open and touched as you've shared the power of this reconciliation. And I'm just wondering for you, what have you learned personally or professionally through this process? I love that question, yes. And actually, I wrote an article about it. It's called Healing the Healer. Because sure, they get a lot out of it, but I too get enormous amount out of it. My father was a Holocaust refugee. The reason I got into this work was to understand the nature of evil. I had studied the Holocaust and perpetrators of violence and figured out why they did it. Now I want to go to prison and figure out why they did it. And what I've gotten is that hurt people hurt people and that all of these people have been harmed before they even did their crimes. So that is sort of intellectual learning. But the real learning for me is about forgiveness and remorse myself. I have to forgive the things that happened in my youth and in my home. I don't say I was traumatized, but I was emotionally abused as a child. And I had a lot of anger. In the 60s, my name was Fury because I was so angry. And now I walk in the shoes of my parents and I see and understand who they were. I mean, my father was a Holocaust refugee. He lost everybody. How could I expect him to be all that I had hoped to have in a parent? My mother was an immigrant child and was of the old world. So how could I have expected her to understand a rebellious, intelligent young woman who wanted to be independent. And they kept trying to squash me. I forgive. I also have enormous remorse for the people that I have harmed. I mean, I have been, I've been an administrator. I've hurt people in that role. As a friend, I've not always been loyal. As a mother, I've made mistakes. And so I want forgiveness from the people that I, too, have harmed. And I feel like I can ask for it now because I've seen the best of the best doing it. My harm is hardly as horrible as theirs. But unfortunately, it's interesting. I have asked forgiveness from two people in particular and not been given it. And I'm shocked. It's like, Open your heart to somebody who is seeking out a connection and apologizing for what they have done, but they're still hardened. I mean, I do know people who's, I know one person whose child was murdered, and she can't believe I'm doing what I'm doing, and she in a million years would never want to meet with the person who killed her child. And I can understand that, but... I don't want to be one of those people who hates or feels and someone who doesn't want to forgive others. So I've heard a lot. And, you know, I'm at the end of my life. I'm pretty old. I'm 70, going to be 79 years old. So it's a good time to be making amends and sort of fixing what I might have broken years and years. That's what I've gotten. Well, as a woman in my 40s, I'm just learning, listening to you. I, I Hopefully, I, I'm only in the mid of my life. I hope I have many more years to go, but I can really resonate with them. Um, and my heart is really touched by the work that you're doing. And 
what you've shared personally. It's it's profound. And I'm just, you know, thinking of this last piece that you said, you know, how that woman isn't able to forgive. And of course, I there's no judgment on me. I've not had a child murdered. And I so I can't say what I would do in that situation, but the idea that there's still pain there for her. And then in contrast, these victims who are able to engage with this process that you describe, how beautiful that healing is, not only for the one who caused the harm, but for the victims and their families and all of that. It's just such a a beautiful truth to hear you speak about. And, you know, and I, I do have to say that there are, I mean, if you look into any of the religions of the world, forgiveness and redemption are part of the ideologies of the philosophies. And so if you are in any way spiritual or seeking a higher self, then this opportunity is available to all of us. You don't have to have committed a murder. You know, you could have spoken harshly to someone and you can make amends. And so I feel like This is coming back to, in Hebrew, there's a word called teshuva, return. Returning to the pure self. Returning to the self who is good and holy and whole. And I feel like I've had the opportunity to experience teshuva, and I keep working on it, and I'm trying to provide that to the men and women that I'm working with. What a beautiful way to finish this off. Holy and whole and good. Yeah, I appreciate you and the work that you're doing and and so appreciate your time and coming to share with us and, and our community. And I'm sure that there's many who are doing the kind of work that you're doing in this. You said it's through the, what system is, is this through? It's through the California criminal justice system of California. And then I have a program that I volunteer for called the HIMSA. But there is restorative justice all over the country. And there's restorative justice in high schools and schools. It's a Native American principle, and it is being embraced globally as an alternative to retribution, an opportunity for people to make whole rather than to break apart. Mm -hmm. To make whole rather than to break apart. Oh, that just gets me right in the heart. I love it. Where can listeners find you and the work that you're doing? And, you know, how can folks get in touch? Oh, I have a website, uh, ElaineLeader.com. And my email is leader, L-E-E-D-E-R at Sonoma.edu. And I would love to hear from people. And I'm also available to come and do talks. Okay. Free of charge on Zoom to whomever is interested in this topic. Oh my gosh, what a fantastic resource and um, opportunity. Thank you so much, Elaine, for coming and joining us. And I look forward to continuing to follow your work. Thank you. It's been a, a lovely conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Are you interested in deepening your understanding of NARM? We're excited to present the Inner Circle, NARM's online learning community. Each month, members receive direct mentorship from NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller and NARM training director, Brad Kammer, access to NARM demonstrations with extensive debriefs and the opportunity to engage with the hub for the international NARM community. Dive in with a free 14-day trial and access the three-month archive by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash free trial. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma. <laughs>